Welcome back, everyone. This is the Space Prize Guest Speaker Series, Episode 8. It is June 22nd, 2022. Uh, I'm excited to have uh, Dr. Leslie Anderson back with us to, uh, to host the interview, and Dr. Soyun Yi as our guest speaker today, the first and so far only South Korean astronaut. So uh, I will introduce both of them a little bit more in a few minutes, but uh, I'm Dr. Mark Wagner, the uh, president of the Space Prize Foundation. I'm gonna say a few words about the foundation before we kick off in case we have new, uh, new viewers. Uh, then I'll introduce uh, Leslie and Leslie will introduce uh, Soyun and we will be off to the races. So a few words about Space Prize. We have just a few weeks ago wrapped up the first Space Prize Challenge the focus is to inspire and empower young women to explore and pursue STEAM education and explore careers in the growing space industry. So we are uh, doing that primarily through attention grabbing uh, contests with spectacular prizes and through education programs like uh, this guest speaker series and our forthcoming curriculum. Uh, the uh, Girls in New York City, we worked with five schools in the five boroughs. There was a essay contest in January, a video contest in February, and by March, uh, the finalists all went to the simulated mission to Mars at the Challenger Center in Manhattan that you see here. Uh, the same uh, finalists had their names up on massive Times Square billboards. It was a really fantastic experience for them and an opportunity to draw uh, attention to gender equity in space. Then we had a number of winners go to the new leadership program at uh, Space Camp at the US Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, called Space Camp Lift. And just this past uh, month, five of our winners went on a zero G flight uh, out of uh, Newark, just near Manhattan. They actually got to take the helicopter from Manhattan to Newark and then take a zero G flight uh, with Denise Crosby from Star Trek uh, and our executive director, um, Tim Masharia, also got to fly with him. So a really spectacular experience. Uh, if you get a chance to watch it on our YouTube channel, we now have a full hour interview of them after the experience where they talk about how the, the contest and the flight has changed their perspective. And they're all so eloquent. Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, with respect to other stuff that we're working on at Space Prize, if you just head over to spaceprize.org, you can see more about our programs. We just launched a challenge in Paris, very, very similar to the New York one. Um, five finalists will get to uh, go to IAC in Paris in September, and one will get a zero G flight as well on a, uh, another provider in, in, uh, uh, in Paris. And we have a forthcoming space education curriculum. The first half of it is due out at the end of this month. So we're really excited about that. We'll have four of these chapters ready for you with the next four uh, due out by the end of the summer. So it's an ambitious curriculum that doesn't just look at uh, a history of uh, space exploration and intro to space science. It also looks at why space matters, uh, at a, a real broad look at the new space economy, uh, and it gets into space philosophy, the issues of sustainability and governance and ethics, uh, and looking at future implications. So really, really excited about that work and can't wait to release that and share that with everyone. The, uh, the other uh, free to all students and uh, educators around the world and enthusiasts like those we have with us right now is this speaker series uh, featuring astronauts, engineers, scientists, entrepreneurs, designers, lawyers, historians, you name it, uh, from all over the space industry, looking at a variety of career trajectories uh, and a variety of different perspectives. A lot of uh, really wonderful and influential women from across the industry, some men as well, but uh, it's shaping up to be a great series so far. So thank you to everybody who has joined us uh, live today. It's really fantastic. We once again have a great international representation. Um, we hope you will participate in the chat. And if you uh, would like to pipe in, feel free to use the raise hand feature, or this is a small enough group. If you're on camera, just raise your hand. Um, and uh, I, we love to have people speak up too. So feel free to unmute and share screen when you're invited to do that. Or again, it's a small group. If you want to just interject, uh, I think we should be fun. Uh, you can ping me in the chat or use the help feature if you need any help. The only other thing we'd like to point out is occasionally we will leave some wait time between questions, uh, just in case our guest has more to say or in case one of you has another question um, that's, that's by design. Uh, any questions at this point before we dive in? Okay, fantastic. 
Uh, I will once again introduce our host, Dr. Leslie Anderson. Uh, Leslie is a science teacher. She taught at the High Tech High uh, here in California. She has uh, done research all over the world, studying sea turtles and great white sharks and uh, ice cores in Antarctica. Um, she has uh, worked at JPL, and uh, we are really excited to have her here uh, hosting uh, this program. She also, for, uh, for what it's worth, uh, does curriculum development and is working with us on the space education curriculum. So uh, thank you, Leslie, once again for, for joining us. Uh, I'm always grateful for you uh, giving your time to this project. Um, and on top of that, she's recovering from COVID and still, still made it today. So we're, we're, we're happy to have her here. Um, from here, she'll introduce uh, the, Dr. Soyun Yi and, uh, and lead the interview. I'll pipe in if I, if I can help with anything, but uh, take it away, Leslie. Thank you, Mark. And it's true, I do have COVID brain a little, so I'm going to rely on the rest of you guys to be helping to ask some questions today as well. Um, but I'm so excited I get a chance to introduce Dr. Soyun Yi who is South Korea's first and only astronaut. She was selected as an astronaut in December, 2006 out of 36,000 contestants vying for the title of South Korea's first astronaut. During her 11 day mission at the International Space Station, Dr. Yi completed an aggressive number of experiments contributing to South Korea's science textbooks and science channel television lectures. During her historical return to earth on April 19th of 2008, she survived a force of nearly 16 Gs versus the traditional 4G average upon the ballistic reentry. Due to reentry complications, the first to welcome her to her return to Earth were nomads in the plains of Kazakhstan. Don't worry, we're going to ask you a lot of questions and tell you can get a chance to tell your story about that. Um, but currently, Dr. Yi is working with a biotechnology startup as the managing director, business development, and partnership. Dr. Yi is not only volunteering for various nonprofits as an inspiring speaker, but also lecturing at the University of Washington and local community colleges. When she can find spare time, she enjoys singing, hot yoga, gardening, crafts, camping, and hiking. So Dr. Yi, thank you so much for being here. The first question I'd like to know about, how did you come to be South Korea's first astronaut? Oh yeah, thank you for asking. Actually, it was a little bit different from the NASA or Russia or European astronaut selection because it was the very first uh, astronaut selection process. Uh, yeah, if I can allow, Mark, can I share my screen also if it is necessary? Yeah, feel free. I believe I already gave you permission, so try it out. Okay, yeah, let me show you. Yeah, depends on the question. Sometimes kind of better to show the order. So we have these four kind of level and then step of the selection process. So 2006, April, they open for the uh, application. So I still remember the day I apply, April 21st, 2006, because that day is the science day in Korea. It's a national kind of uh, science day. And then they just start from there because this astronaut uh, program is a huge inspiration of the STEM education in Korea, especially for the young kids and students. So on that day, I really want to apply as soon as possible, but, but when I click it, I'm still behind the several thousand. And then even the website is uh, broke down because of the, a lot of people's success in the same time. So I and my friends are a little bit Kind of disappointed and we just give up and then get out for the beer and then forgot about that but the next day my friends remind me so and so you will not apply anymore and then you are not interested anymore but oh you know what at least i can apply because i'm already prepared because i'm thinking about how i can introduce myself and then they already told you needed to submit all different kinds of transcription and resume and kind of like that i already prepared so i don't want to give up so I applied and I realized I'm a little behind the several thousand. And then I just thought like, if I were a committee, I might be bored to read all those thousands and thousands of the application and resume. So maybe after several thousand, their focus will not be <laughs> totally distracted. And then my resume will not be come up. And then, so I had totally no hope to be selected even for the first step. But actually I have my own goal as an engineer. We needed to have a step-by-step -step goals and what you wanna do after that. So 
I shared with my friends, I really want to get to the first stage, be the final 300, because on the announcement, public announcement, they said after several screening, they will pick the first 300. But interesting thing is, they cannot make a qualified 300, so they made a 245 instead of the 300. And then when I get the email, uh, Mrs. Soyani, you make a 245. Do you want to keep going or do you want to withdraw? And then it, it was like a dream because it is in the middle of my PhD program. So I don't know how many people that do uh, did the PhD program before, but actually every day is a kind of pulling me down is the PhD program. <laughs> so yeah. experiment fail, proposal fail, and my advisor keep telling me stupid. And, and so almost every day is a kind of depressed. But this email is a little sunshine in the middle of the depressed PhD program. And I was so happy. And I felt like it's over because I made my goal. And then my friend says, so do you want to keep doing? And then I just thought, maybe I want to try as much as I can. And then I was pretty sure I cannot make final 30, but at least I want to try because I really want to check how far I can go. And after psychological checkup, interview, and physical checkup, English interview, and they made a 30. I got an email and I was so excited. All my friends are so excited because all 30 people's names and photo is on the newspaper articles right next day. And then my mom was so excited because she found her daughter in the newspaper. <laughs> and then after 30, actually until 30, it was a secret to my PhD advisor because very Korean professor, they want their PhD students distracted by anything. So, <laughs> and when I told him I made a th uh, final 30 and then he told me like, do you really think you can make it? You better focus on your PhD thesis. So don't waste your time. And it, it, it's very straightforward for the uh, research. And I, I already anticipate his reaction and all my lemmate also anticipate his reaction. And then one of, one of my lemmate told me like, what if you will make, how can he uh, kind of handle if you will make final two or one? And then but all we just left out and then finally I made your final 10. And after making final 10, every single daily newspaper covered a 10 person's face and name on the almost cover page. And then my professor came to me like, uh, now you should make final two. <laughs> so he was totally against me, but changed his mind. And he just cheering me up to make a final two. And we had a camp training. We went to the Russia and then did the hydro lab and Georgia. And 2006, Christmas day, they announced a final two. And then I was one of the final two and I went to the Russia. Yeah, that's the kind of process actually the reason why it's different is we don't have any prerequisite because they want to make a whole national festival. So anybody who want to be an astronaut, you can apply. And that is a huge marketing and promoting kind of thing. But most of the European country, Canada and US already have a prerequisite. So first contestant cannot be the several 10,000. So it is a little bit different. Yeah. That's an amazing story. And I bet a lot of people can relate to um, what you were sharing about your professor going from not being very supportive to now he wants to be on your side. Um, and that's a testament to the, the will that you had in order to do that. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what your experience was like on the ISS? What types of science were you doing? Uh, yeah, so actually, even uh, I, I think pretty much is uh, every single astronaut are similar. Uh, we didn't design our own experiment because all the space mission is uh, divided by the, every single small little step. So my case is not only for an astronaut, but also for the scientific experiment, we had a huge competition because Korean government opened to the whole country, all the national labs and commercial companies and government agency, especially science and technology, they can propose any experiment to be the first Korean experiment in space. So we have a several thousand proposal around the uh, whole Korea, across the whole Korea. And then they picked the 18 different kinds of experiment. They just diversified the uh, 
field as much as possible. So one from chemistry, one from the bio, one from the medical, one from the electric engineering, one from physics. So they try to make as fair as possible. And also several from the national lab, several from the commercial research lab, and several from the engineering school. And then bottom four is from the primary, middle school, high school science textbook. Because we learn Newton's law, we learn zero gravity and vacuum in space in the textbook, but we cannot do the experiment in the science lab. So they want me to do the experiment in the space. And all those experiments became a DVD to make the educational contents in the elementary, middle school, and high school. So even still now, some of the students in Korea, they watch my video and then learn about the Newton's law. So very honorable. And I'm so honored to do that. And then that's because those school experiment is most responsible and most tough for me because I should make a video and then explain science for the kids as easy as possible. But as a PhD student and a professional researcher, it's not easy to explain with a plain language about the kind of physics and kind of like that. And then we already spoiled it with all different kinds of abbreviation <laughs> and then terminology. So it's kind of hard. And also in the middle of the experiment, sometimes I made a mistake and sometimes it doesn't go well as I expected. And, but I never ever should speak F words or bad words, even if I impulsively say something because it's for the kids. Yeah, so that's also a hard part. <laughs> and if I made some awkward pause or something behind and I cannot come back and then I cannot retake. So I should be so careful to make as perfect as possible for the kids and students. But you know what? I, I, I feel so embarrassed, but I cannot help confessing it. And then one video, I should make a Korean flag behind as a background. But actually flag is a kind of, Korean flag has direction of the up and down and right and left. But it's really hard to figure it out if you are so nervous because every day I know which direction is right. I totally know. But in the middle of the space flight and then there is a camera in front of me and I'm so nervous about the speaking, you know, children's words and then explain. So actually I put the Korean flag kind of upside down and uh, not upside down. It's a kind of front and back kind of thing. So actually even backside is very clear and you can see the older color. You don't know which side is a back and which side is front. So I put the backside in front and then kind of like that. And then after coming back, committee reviewed that. Oh my God, Suyan, Korean flag is left is right, right is left. It's kind of possible because I checked up and down because red is always up and then blue is always down. And then the committee said, yeah, red is up, but you just rotating like that. And then, really? And so I made a mistake. And then after coming back, how can I do that? So then got one of the TV company, computer graphic professional, <laughs> he just edited it because it's for the educational material. I cannot make a mistake. So those kind of parts, nobody can imagine that, but that's a small little mistake. So it makes my whole flight a little bit depressed. And then that, that, that's still, I remember that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story with us. Oh, did you want to share some more of those pictures? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, because most of the yeah, students- Yeah, give us a tour. Yeah, most of the students are wondering about the restroom. So right side is the ISS restroom, ISS restroom. And then left on the bottom is the soil a capsule restroom. Actually, it's not exactly a restroom. It's more like a bathroom locker. locker. So in those small little locker, and then you can take it off the, those funnels and kind of like that. And you can do that. It's in a small little habitation module. And then right top corner is the emergency bathroom. If the soil capsule bathroom is not working or IS uh, bathroom is not working and then you can use a temporarily one-time use a bathroom. So most of the, especially primary school students and then many of the adults, they always wonder about how the bathroom works in the zero gravity. So I always have this photo on my presentation. I love that. Yes, kids always want to know, how do you go to the bathroom in space? <laughs> uh, we have a question from someone in our audience asking if you know whether or not the, oh, do you know that the International Astronomical Union is meeting in South Korea this year in August? And will you oh. be there for your experience? 
Oh, yeah, I heard about that. I heard because some of my friends are astronomer and then they astrophysicist also. And then they are promoting about the uh, kind of IAU in Busan in August. So I don't know if I can make it or not because in August I have a plan to visit Korea, but I don't know my schedule will be overlapped or not. But they have a huge preparation, not only for the, those con Congress, but also they want to make an astronomical festival in Busan city because Busan city is the second biggest city in South Korea. Awesome. Well, I'm sure if you do end up making it there, you've got a lot of people that would love to hear your story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, now the moment we're all waiting for. Can you tell us about the return to Earth and that hectic, crazy story that you referenced earlier? Ah, uh, yeah, right, yeah, right. Actually, uh, we couldn't expect that uh, uh, because right before my flight, they had a police reentry. And then those ballistic reentry is not that kind of usual and often in a Russian space, uh, human space flight history for 50 years. So with those kind of low probability, if I already have a ballistic reentry before you, you can be pretty much sure that I will not have because for whole 50 years, only several happenings have, uh, we have. So we didn't uh, kind of worry about too much, but on the way back, Unfortunately, there's a problem. Uh, you can see the soil capsule on my background. <laughs> and then those up top kind of sphere shape is the habitational module. And then right below there's a descent module and then all the way down white right one is the instrument module. But only in the middle part, descent module should be down on the earth and then all other parts should be separated and they will bunt totally uh, during the penetration of the atmosphere. So that's the separation. But during our separation, even if our system told us on the board, you have a successful separation, but realistically outside, habitation module on top of us is still kind of dangling on top because there's a four pyro bolt on top of a descending module, but only two was to blow up and then two is not blow. So they just kind of dangling like that on top of us and it make a huge kind of weight on top of us. So actually down area like here, we have a heat shield. So when we come down to the atmosphere, there's a crazy high kind of friction hit happening. So we have a heat shield bottom so we can come down, but because a huge weight on top of us, so we just come down to the earth upside down. And then those habitation module is a keep burning on the earth. So we are just riding on the fire actually on the downway. Uh, so uh, so is the capsule and says, so is the system sense it. We are upside down and we have a problem like that. So they change it, our flight mode into the ballistic reentry. Then there's no control we can make because ballistic reentry is most reliable and safest way to come back. And then actually 34 years ago, when the Bostocks and an early Soyuz flight, those ballistic reentry was a normal reentry. So we go there like a safe mode. And we didn't know separation problem, but we knew ballistic reentry happened and then something happened outside. And we already had uh, several times of training with the ballistic reentry and an abnormal uh, situation. So we just followed the protocol, we just followed the manual. But after a while, uh, we could feel like that. And then first parachute deployed, and then those parachutes pull us up. So we can come back to the right direction and then come down. So actually from those parachute deployment, we landed very normally on the, in the middle of the Kazakhstan. But problem is our trajectory is totally changed. And a mission control and looking at us is the anticipated area because right before penetrate atmosphere, we told them everything's normal, separation going well normal because on the system, they said. But right after that, totally change it. But during the penetrating uh, atmosphere, we cannot have any radio communication because outside is a flaring several thousand degrees Celsius. So MCC watching of this direction, but we are entering a totally other direction. So they think we are gone and they don't know where we are. And then, but we think that they can find us with the radar. So right after touchdown, we just wait because normal landing is once you land, such and rescue come to your capsule and then they knock 
and open the hatch and they pull us outside of the capsule. So actually we wait for 10, 20 minutes and I wait, 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 but nobody knocked us. So we realized that maybe cause of the ballistic reentry, we landed on the totally other area. Maybe such a rescue team cannot find us. So my commander, Yuri Malenchenko said, we better get out of the capsule and we should check where we are. So luckily we just landed not like this and side by side. So uh, Peggy Weston, she's the all the way left side and she was dangling on the ceiling and I was in the middle. And then our commander is on the bottom. So commander told me, let me unstrap and then open the hatch. I will crawl outside of capsule. So Tuya, and you can unstrap and you can follow me. So, okay, I will try, but how about Peggy? And then he said, because we are from the zero gravity, we even cannot stand up. We, because right after landing, we cannot even stand up because we are still so dizzy because of all the blood going down and we already are custom. And then, kind of adapt on the zero gravity. So right after landing, if you are normal kind of average person, you feel so dizzy and you can stand up, even if you have a really tight corset and then kind of blood blockage, not to go down to the bottom, but still you feel dizzy. So he and I said, sorry, Peggy, we cannot help you. So we will check out the outside first. And if there's a help, we can bring them and help you get out of that. And then we get out and then we realize that some nomadic people is watching us and staring us because they feel so shocked. Something coming from the sky and a big, huge rock. And then still outside is the burning because our capsule is burning. It's not over yet. So we burned several kilometers outside. So cause of that smoke, those nomad come to the place and found the strange rock from the sky. And then they just watching us from the distance because they cannot be sure what it is. It's very interesting because around the area, every three months, every six months, Russian uh, Soyuz capsule landing, those nomadic people already know what the Soyuz it is and what's the cosmos it is. But we are uh, landed on the 500 kilometer away from there. So those nomad had no idea what's going on. So <laughs> they even cannot come close to us at the very first time. But one of the member of those nomad and an old guy, he can speak a little bit of the Russian and then we can speak, little, uh, we already speak Russian and then we just communicate each other. And he was pretty sure we are also human. <laughs> and then they just come to close to us. And then we ask them to get inside of the storage capsule. And then they support the Peggy, our astronaut and we unstrap and help the other astronaut come out of the capsule, we lay down on the grass. And then we just thought such a rescue team, even if it will take a little bit while, but they might find us. But after almost 30 minutes, nobody come to us, no helicopter come to us. So we realized that we better call them. So we asked a small little boy among the nomad and ask him, can you go inside of the solar capsule? And then can you find the iridium phone and a GPS in there and we just explain where it is and then he just bring in anything and is it no so he he even doesn't know what phone looks like so because it's in the middle of nomad and they live like a hundred years ago they don't have a camera they don't have cell phone at the time so he bring everything and is it is it and then finally he bring the right thing and we call to MTC and the MTC feels so relieved because they think they lost us and then we let them know our GPS location. So after kind of 10, 20 minutes later, one helicopter make to us. And that's also funny because once the helicopter land and they realize that those nomad people that touch us and help us and then they just yell, go, 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 go away. Don't touch our Ashra, don't touch. And then don't come to our soils. And then they made the yellow ribbon around the soils capsule and then make the older nomad get out. And then we feel a little bit embarrassed because they helped us a lot. But search and rescue team cannot help it because in the area we always land on, some nomad people stole our watch and stole our jewelry. And then kind of things happen, not always, but several times. So search and rescue team feels so sensitive with the nomad people. So they just yelled to them. But those innocent nomad, they had no idea, but they just kicked out of that. But after for a while, search and rescue team, they, Normally they bring the three helicopters to help the three astronauts, but because it's too far away, two small helicopters cannot make the fuel to get to us. So one big, huge helicopter came with only emergency people. So they realized that they have a short hands to help all three astronauts. 
So they just cut the ribbon and then go out. Can you guys help us? And those, those nomads come back and they just carried us and help us. So it was a very movie-like situation after my landing. It was so funny and embarrassing. <laughs> What an amazing story. And we, we're having people ask, is there like a film that's been created about this or like a book or anything? Because this is an amazing story. It should be told. Yeah, I think maybe one day somebody want to do that. So far, we don't have. And then even at the time, you don't have any camera inside a capsule, outside a capsule. And Nomad doesn't have a camera until the search and rescue team. So I even don't have a photo right after my landing. <laughs> so, but hopefully we can make some kind of movie or documentary in the future. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I would totally watch that. That sounds like an amazing, and what a what an amazing way to re-enter coming back to the world and just being in a totally different, different place. Wow. Um, I, I right, imagine, well, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead I, I was wondering if all of the uh, communication with the nomads took place in Russian. Yeah, it, it is a kind of Russian because some of them speak a little broken Russian and then we already have a one Russian crew and then both American and then my case is we learn Russian so we can communicate Russian language. Thank God. And then Kazakhstan, kind of all the education always including the Russian because they are in the Soviet Union. So yeah, thank God. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just ask you who or what inspired you to be interested in space? Why did you decide that you wanted to become the first South Korean astronaut? Uh, frankly speaking, I've never thinking about space or being an astronaut for whole my life until I applied for an astronaut. Uh, it's a little bit surprising, but it's not that surprising in Korea around that time because when I moved in U.S. and then living with my husband, most amazing and interesting and surprising thing is every single American kids, they love Star Wars and Star Trek. They even debate against each other. And they always talking about space and all the games, uh, background is the space, the environment is space. So they are always talking about space, especially kind of boys who love computer graphics or um, sci-fi movie, kind of like that. But when I grew up in Korea, especially I was born around the, uh, kind of late 70 and an early 80, still Korea has a hard time to feed their own people and right after Korean war. And we don't have any kind of extra or kind of luxury to look up to the nice sky or thinking about space. Even if around that time, Russia and US, they have a competition each other to go to the moon and they have a lot of things, but as a small little country who had a hard time, we couldn't have any mindset about space. and then. I've never watched any sci-fi movie during my childhood and student life because I cannot afford it. And also we don't have a movie theater around our town because I grew up in rural area. And also in Korea, we don't have much kind of space related to movie and animation, only several from US. But if you are living in Seoul, maybe you can heard about it, but live outside of the Seoul, it's hard to know that. And several animation from the Japan is background is a space, but it's very luxury to me. So I, I've never thought about that. But I know I'm good at math and science. And then I decided to go to the engineering school only because that gave me the more opportunity to get a better paid job in the future to help my family and then taking care of my brother and sister in the future. And then only be, uh, kind of leaving and studying, you know, engineering school, that helps me to learn more about the science and sci-fis and movies and novels and hear the story from my friends who grew up with the movie. But still, it's very strange to me. But when the Korean government announced that they will have a astronaut program in the very first time in Korean history, my motivation is, they try to find a person who can take in care of the experiment in the space station. So I even doesn't good mind about the word Ashna. I just focus on, oh, doing the experiment in the space. Actually, my daily job is doing the experiment in the, my clean lab, uh, clean room and then lab. So what if I can do this in the space? That would be amazing. That would be really cool. So that that's driving for me and then apply for a the program, but not to be an astronaut, not to be the first Korean astronaut, but to do the experiment in space. <laughs> so even until that time, I 
couldn't think about being an astronaut. So sometimes I regret that because I should research about more and then I should know about the, what the big responsibility on the shoulder of being the first uh, country's astronaut. But at the time I was way too naive. And then, oh, doing the cool uh, uh, experiment in space, that would be wonderful. So that's the thing. But nowadays in Korea, it's a totally different. And then a lot of space, kind of themed movie happening, not only in Netflix, but also movie theater. And when I was a kid, if I go to the science museum, there's only several kind of space themed folder and then frames, that's all, not any exhibition at all. It's just the one small room. But nowadays, if, whenever I visit Korea, more science museum happen and all 3D and a real kind of artifact and a very experiential science museum. So th that, that's really great. So I believe, STEM and science and space working with the art and culture is really, really important because even if it looks not realistic, if you think and start thinking about that and you can inspire, it can be inspired and you want to be the person who make it happen. And that's really huge driving force. So that, that's a little bit of the jealousy feeling about me when I move in US very first time. <laughs> Yeah, we're getting some questions. About what are you doing now? Where are you located? And what have you been working on since your space flight? Uh, can you uh, tell me again? It's a little bit broken, so I cannot hear you well. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'll try to repeat that again. Um, mm -hmm. So where are you living now? And what have you been doing since your space flight? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So right now I'm living in Seattle, Washington. And then some people ask me why over there. I would never imagine what thinking about, first of all, living in US because until my PhD, I studied in Korea and I living in Korea, I've never thought about if I will live in outside of the Korea. But after my space flight, working in a space agency in Korea, and then I realized that I needed to develop myself more to serve and contribute for the community and people more. And those driving force and in kind of motivation, I came to US to study my MBA after my space flight because I already know about an insight in the science and technology, but I have a big, huge headache, how I can help my genius scientists and technologists friends because I'm already far away from my research field for working for a space agency. And then I don't have any publication. I don't have a research experience for five, six years during the serving as an astronaut. And then to thinking about my career, and then I should have something to help science and technology community in Korea. And then, then I better understand the business or how can uh, kind of invest them, how can help them better way because a lot of engineers and scientists, they are not good at money and business kind of like that. So I wanna be the bridge between those two group of the people, two totally different animal actually. But during that time, I met my husband and he lived in Seattle and Washington. And after my graduate in an MBA program, we just decided where should we go, where we should better settle down. And we picked the Seattle over the California, even if I studied in uh, Bay Area, UC Berkeley. And uh, uh, kind of from that time, 2014, I'm still working and living here. And, but, I'm not stuck in here. And then from time to time, I visit Korea and then helping a lot of events and then inspiring kids and also around the globe and community, uh, some community serve and then uh, inspiring the space and science. And also as uh, you introduced me and then working with uh, several startups, not only in space field, but also biotechnology, the original, my background and then working with them. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions from the chat that I'm just gonna start to go through here. And again, if you've got questions of your own, please feel free to put those in the chat as well. Um, so with your 10 days in space, it sounds like you were very busy with all of your experiments. Did you manage to do everything that you wanted to while you were up there? Oh, thank you so much for asking. It, it was a very interesting uh, moment before my flight. And then it's the very first Korean astronauts flight. So Korean government wanna put as many experiments possible in those nine days window. Even if my full flight is 11 days, but two days in a third capsule. So I have a little bit less than nine days in a ISS, but first day arriving in a lot of official event and last day, I should pack everything 
and then cannot do anything. So pretty much seven days, a whole week I only have, but there's more than 16 experiments. So several Russian officials came to me, so you cannot make all of the experiments. But even if you cannot make all of them, you don't have to feel bad because it's more than double of the mission than average astronaut because most of the astronauts, they stayed three months or six months or a year, but they have a spread it, uh, mission a little bit uh, evenly. But my case is only seven days to pack everything. So actually Russian officials recommend the Korean government is way too many. So you better decrease and then Korean government, that's our time. So we will manage it. We will control it. So they don't, they don't accept those advice and put everything. And then I still remember one of my kind of high boys. And then right before my launch, and he came to me in a quarantine hotel, and he told me, "Son, you know what? For a whole week, even if you don't sleep at all, you will not be killed. So those seven days, whole your life is really meaningful. So you should do your best to make it as much as possible." But several Russian officials said that if she sacrifice her sleep or sacrifice her relaxing time, that can disturb American and Russian astronaut sleep or something. So they just try to make them compromise, but still it's not possible. And then I totally understand what they feel they are feeling because they don't know when we will be the second flight. They don't know when they will make a second astronaut in the Korea. So they really want to do that as much as possible. But not because it's my job, but because as a scientist who are doing the science, what if I'm the scientist who send the experiment to the astronaut? So that's, that's my reflection. So I can do by the schedule, but some experiment can take the longer time and some experiment can take the even triple more time. But what if my experiment is at the end of the line, if I miss, and then I, I might feel so bad. So actually, I feel more sympathized with the person who sent the experiment rather than the, my strict boss. So I really want to help their experiment because they prepared for two, three years to make this fly. And they are so wondering and then craving about the data after my experiment. So actually I sacrificed my break time and sleeping time and eating time. And then finally I finished it as much as possible. So. I completed all experiment, my standard, but of course, some of the scientists standard, if she tried this one more time, or if she tried to add one more data. So for them still is in my not that enough, but I, I, I did my best because that, that's the kind of responsibility of the person who should do the experiment on behalf of other person who is far from me. That's a great perspective, and I'm sure one of the things that they thought about when they selected you as an astronaut. Um, we have another question from the chat. How did your perspective change after going to space? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you know what? Most interesting and also kind of sad photo from the Korea I always share with my friends and lecture is this. So this is South Korea, but not during the day, but during the night. And then as you can see, you can see the clear border around here. Yeah. So from here, it's North Korea. And from here is the South Korea. Actually, here is the Seoul. Yeah. And actually, I didn't take this photo because during the nighttime, I have a lot of other mission. So I couldn't look down to the earth through the window, only just five, six days I have. But this photo taken by my friend, Scott Kelly, and he said, this photo is for you. I think you really wanna check this out. And he sent it to me. And then right after opening, I realized, oh my God, that's the soul, that's the Korea. Even if he didn't say anything. And then you can see the small little blink in the North Korea is around the Pyongyang, so North Korea's capital. So it, it's really sad because a lot of the senior astronauts around the 60 and 70, they said you cannot see any border between the country from the space. They literally said like that, Yuri Gagarin and Neil Armstrong and then kind of person. But nowadays, modern days, especially technology developed after, you can see the clear border if the developed country 
and underdeveloped country side by side each other. So you cannot see this kind of scenery if you fly over the Europe because France, Germans, and Italia, they are kind of pretty much similar. They all have a nice sky. They all have a street light. They all have electricity in the night. They never sleep in the night, kind of like that. But especially South Korea and North Korea or Mexico and US, Pakistan and India, those kind of huge gap between two countries but side by side, you can see the clear border between the country. And of course, I don't mean we should give something to the North Korea or I don't mean I'm kind of positive or supportive for the North Korean leader, but I mean, how measure, measurable the keys or innocent people lives on the right side, because it's not their fault. And when I look down to the earth in 90 minute space station round whole round of the earth, and you can see the whole round of the earth in 90 minutes, and I just feel like, besides all those big, huge continent and in place, why on earth I was born this small little peninsula, especially Southwest area of the South Korea? Is there any specific reason? No, actually thinking about your school, you apply for it. You're writing, you wrote essay and then committee kind of evaluated and then you are selected. And then you pick your school, you pick your job, you pick your city to live after growing up, but where were you born? You never select. Even your parents, sometimes they cannot have any capability to choose. They just over there. So my case is I was just born in South Korea around the 2070 and 80 is right after economic boom. That's only the reason I can have a better education and became a PhD. What if I were born around this area? No matter how much effort I made, I might not be even survive because of the starving. Well, what if I were born in the middle of the Kazakhstan or Afghanistan or Ukraine right now? And then your life is not under your control most of the time. This is just a happening. And I feel like, first of all, we should be grateful for that because you have a capability to access Zoom. That's a huge standard because more than half of the population on the earth, they cannot have internet still, yeah. And they cannot pay bill for the uh, internet also. And they cannot have laptop or a smartphone, but you have all of that. And then you came to this Zoom meeting and then hearing the story. And then I also can share the story thanks to having those privilege. Even if we don't think it's a huge privilege, but it's a huge privilege actually. And also, a lot of the people misunderstood that you have a better job, you are in a good school because of your effort. But what if you were born in totally opposite side of the earth? It doesn't matter about your effort. It's just happening from the start. It's really unfair. But what I wanna say is because I'm not a Bill Gates, I'm not a kind of Warren Buffett. So I cannot help people who were born in opposite side of the earth. But at least our obligation and responsibility is we should be grateful for what we have. And we should know what privilege we already have because a lot of people who had privilege already, they take as granted and they divide the people. And then they just think I deserve to have that. I am totally deserved to have that, but nobody can be deserved to have the things right now. It's just happening all the way from the first. So that is the big, huge perspective change after my flight because I feel so embarrassing to say that, but I cannot help confessing that. Until my PhD program, I think the whole world is really unfair because I have a hard time. <laughs> so I was born in a rural area. So compared with my friends who were born in Seoul metropolitan city, my family financial is really not good. And my mother and father never be in college, so they cannot give me any advice about my career and life. But some of my friends has, their father is a professor, their mom is a doctor, and they already had a huge privilege, but they cannot know. They think they deserve to have that. So I thought like, oh, it's not fair. If I have a better background, if I have a better family, if I have a better kind of timing wise or location wise, 
I might be more successful and then just complaining about that. But once I go up to the space and look down to the earth, oh my God, I have a huge privilege, but I just complaining, complaining, complaining. So I, I feel so guilty and then embarrassed about that. And then from that time, I always try to recognize something I already have, even if I'm not the person who deserved this. And even little thing, I try to be grateful for having that. So thinking about that, maybe some of the kids in your house still complaining because they don't have a brand new smartphone or they cannot have a brand new <laughs> kind of gaming things and kind of like that. But if they have something to complain, it means they have something. <laughs> if somebody doesn't have a smartphone at all, they don't care about the up-to-date or brand new or something. <laughs> they don't have anything to complain. So I always told my friends also, you know what? Once I became an astronaut, especially in Asian country, I was totally give up to find my love of my life or a husband because aggressive woman is not a good candidate to be a wife in Asian country. But thank God I met my husband and finally married. But I every day I complain about my husband. Please put your socks in a laundry basket. Please taking a shower. Please clean your dish. But after that, I thought, oh my God. Only because I have husband, I can complain. What if I don't have a husband at all? Then nothing to complain, actually. So that's the way how I kind of take care of myself. If I'm upset about something, it means I have something. It means that's the thing I should be grateful for rather than the complaining. So that's the huge perspective change after my space flight. Thank you so much for sharing that. There was so much to unpack in there. And I know a lot of folks were asking questions about the overview effect in the chat. And I think you did a really amazing job sharing that perspective and also your perspective on privilege and ed education. Um, I think that's really valuable for everyone who's listening. Um, I want to finish with a final question. Um, what do you hope to be remembered for when you're gone? And what legacy do you want to leave? Oh, yeah, actually, already I got much more than I deserve because some of the Korean kids who always told me like, oh, when I watch your launch, when I watch your uh, kind of science class DVD from the space. And then that made me thinking about to go to the STEM field or to, to be a scientist. And then even some of the kids told me, so yeah, even if you flew to the space with the Russian rocket, but in 20, 30 years later, I will build the Korean rocket and you will ride for it. And so you should be healthy. And that's so touching. And then that's the thing I really want to be remembered after I'm gone. Because if there's a small little girl, who just told me like, you know what? When I watched the movie, all white Caucasian astronauts around there. So I thought like uh, Asian girls cannot be an astronaut at all, but you gave me a hope. So I can start dreaming to be an astronaut. And then finally I made it. And then kind of like that, or even if I'm not that kind of smart, but in 20, 30 years later, small uh, kind of one Korean female scientist got the Nobel prize. And then they have a speech, she ha will have a speech like, how you can be in you know, a science field. And then she said, oh yeah, when I was in primary school, I watched the first Korean astronaut's flight. And then she inspired me to study science. And from that time, I pushed my dream so hard. And finally I'm here. And then those kind of scenarios is a really kind of dreaming and fantasy. It, it doesn't matter if it will happen really or not, but that's the one big, huge things I pray for and then hoping for. And that's the one of the huge driving force to, to look back my life. Because thinking about that, and then some of astronauts sometimes made a mistake. And then some of the astronauts had a kind of their lifetime problem with a lot of the personal issues and kind of like that. So when I met the, one of the former documentary producer in Korea, because he's in charge of the my whole flight documentary in Korea. And he told me, Oh, uh, Dr. E, maybe I will visit you again in 20 years later because I want to follow up your life after 20 years, your flight. And then I said, yeah, to make your documentary more kind of exciting, maybe if I be an alcoholic or drug addicted or if I'm divorced, maybe your documentary will be more exciting and funny. 
But, <laughs> but even if make your documentary boring, I really want to be the good example of the students or kids who will watch me. So sometimes I have a really hard time with coping with the media or a newspaper article because some of them make a total fake news and to just bring the kind of clicking kind of thing. And then several friends of mine told me like, Soyeon, you should sue them. You should bring them to the court. But I decided not to because for the five-year-old kids and seven-year-old kids, if the astronaut fight against somebody with any reason, for them, it's not a good example because thinking about as a mom and dad, you always told your kids, don't fight against your friends and then be the team, good team and a good, be good member. You cannot make a whole excuse why I'm fighting against somebody in front of the five-year-old kids. Best way is you better be the friendly and a good person rather than the fighting with somebody. So whenever I have some kind of uh, face to conflict, I always should remember the kids who is watching me and who is thinking about me as a mentor or a role model. So that's sometimes uncomfortable, but I think that's the kind of cross I should carry as the first country's astronaut. <laughs> Dr. Yi, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your stories and your amazing perspective. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark to close us out again for tonight, but thank you again so much for sharing your perspective tonight or thank today. You. Yeah, thank you both. Yeah, so Yin, so special to have you on and to hear uh, those stories. It's, <laughs> it's entertaining to hear about the descent and, and, and sobering to see that picture of of South Korea and North Korea and um, just really inspiring to hear your perspective on it all and your, your hope for the future. Uh, it also occurs to me that you talked about uh, students who saw your mission saying they, they were gonna make the, the, the first uh, South Korean rocket. And of course, yesterday uh, it, it, it launched. Um, yeah, you're so, right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. But it's all, not, not even 15 years after your mission, right? It's, uh, it's really fantastic. Yeah, right. That's that's wonderful. And then I, I I felt so happy that and then some of the kids who watch me, my launch, but they already became a 20, 30 years old and then they are part of the program. And then their dream job is to kind of join the Kari Space Agency and then kind of like that. And then some of the space startup founder, they are only 20, but they talked about my flight because they watched me like that. So yeah, that that's really thankful yeah that's really. really great i'm so i'm so happy for you and 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 impressed and and <laughs> humbled to have you on the show and and hear your stories thank you so much for being with us uh thank you again leslie for for being here to uh to lead the interview and uh and thank you to everybody who who joined us again live and left questions in the chat and participated it's really fantastic to to see familiar faces and uh and a couple of new faces in there too uh, if anybody's watching this on YouTube, uh, please join us live. It's Wednesdays at, uh, at 4 p.m. And you can register at spaceprize.org slash speakers. I think I will end on that note this week, Leslie. Thank you again, Soyun. I'll be around for a few minutes if anybody wants to chat. <laughs>